You're listening to The New Paris. I'm your host, Lindsay Tremuda. Of all the cuisines that have had a presence in Paris but always deserve to be more prominent, Lebanese cooking ranks high among them. France is home to the largest Lebanese diaspora in Europe, so it's no surprise that key dishes and ingredients are familiar to many diners. But most establishments hew to classics. That is, of course, until the opening of Kubri on the Rue Amlo at the end of last year that has lent a creative, contemporary twist. And that's thanks to today's guest and tremendously talented chef, Rita Higgins. We talk about her foray into food, how she updates Lebanese cooking for Paris, and why she thinks it's been such a hit with local diners. Rita, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I am obsessed with your cooking. Um, I think we can just say that um, in that way. I'm so pleased to have met you. Um, I think that night when I went into Kubri, end of January, I had just failed my uh, driving test for the first time. Oh, no. My, uh, you know, the practice, the actual, uh, what do you call that? The practical exam. And yet you improved my mood and the experience improved my mood so immediately that I was like, whatever, I'll I'll cross that bridge again, you know, in a month. But it was such a revelation. And I, you know, I just, I just, we have to talk about this. Um, <laughs> we, I, I had to have you on to talk about this. So well, now it's been, for... this was in November, right? You opened end of yeah. November. Yeah. Now we are in July. So it's, you've had quite a number of months. Yeah. As the executive chef, head chef at Kubri. Um, what is it like for you, given that, and, you know, we'll, we'll backtrack a little bit, but seeing in, what, eight, nine months, what you have developed, uh, the Monde just dedicated a whole profile to you. I mean, <laughs> what does that feel like for you? It's very exciting on the outside, but what does it feel like for you? It's um, honestly surreal right now. Uh, as you've said, we've been open only since November. So even though it's been, you know, almost a whole revolving year, because sure, we opened in November, but you know, I've been on to this project since April 2021. Oh, wow. So it's been going on for a while. I mean, when we first set foot in that actual physical place, it was um, it was actually in June of last year. So really, it's been a while that sh- I've been on the ground doing this. We've been in the restaurant testing since September. We did open in November. But somehow it just feels like we're still in the thick of it. It feels like, you know, I personally didn't have the time yet to just, you know, sit back and and just appreciate what's happened. But at the mean, in the meantime, I do get some little glimpses of oh my God, we did this. Mm. Like, oh my gosh, this happened. Um, A little pat on the back or uh, just pride, really. Mm. Uh, I do have these moments, just like, uh, you know, because, you know, I had my daughter shortly before we opened the restaurant and and comparing these two life events um i thought you know it would stop there the opening of the restaurant and the birth of my child but really you go through those stages of development you know you keep an eye on your child oh she's sitting up now oh she had her first tooth oh she had this and that and you sort of enjoy these milestones whilst still being, you know, sleep deprived and tired and so on. (laughs) It's the same thing for the restaurant. Like, oh my gosh, there's been an amazing article or we've had so-and-so reviews or, you know, whatever. We're full every night. You need to, all these little wins, we appreciate them. But at the same time, it's just still hard to, you know, sit and and look back at it and say, Right. You don't have the time for that. You're in the storm. Yeah, still. It's a good storm, but it's It's an amazing storm. But and not to mention you opened this is in a in a I don't want to say post COVID because I think that makes it sound like there's been a finite end to COVID, which isn't true. But, uh, you know, in the in the reopening, full reopening of society and a lot of people have left the restaurant industry. And I know, you know, uh, hotels are still struggling with staff. Restaurants are still struggling with a lot of uh, people who left or young people getting in who have a different relationship to work. I mean, it's kind of the ongoing discussion. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, you don't really have time to slow down. No. Right? 
It's, you know, the nature of the industry anyway. It's always fast-paced. There's always something happening in a restaurant. There's never a day that looks like the other or never a day where there's no surprise happening, whether a good or bad one, but usually not so cool ones. You know, you just walk into a million disasters and that's how you start your day from suppliers not delivering or delivering the wrong product or a machine breaking down. There's always something happening. But this this instability in terms of staffing and teams, it's uh, always been an issue as well, but even more so after COVID. Again, it's not over yet, but, you know, this the, the whole confinement period of COVID, yeah, yeah. which, you know, put people in a place where they had to uh, reconsider their life choices and what truly matters or not. Mm. And that sort of sifted through people who are either just completely, you know, burnt out and finally have gotten the chance to, they've got to take it out. Yeah. And, you know, COVID made them stay home. They made them look for other sources of revenue, et cetera. Mm. And eventually that turned into the new reality for them. Mm. There are people who have just, you know, simply decided they don't want to work as much. They don't want a stressful lifestyle mm. and that maybe you can earn as much money doing something else. And you've got, you know, the third category of the newcomers who have no idea. I think... There's this whole uh, side of romanticizing the industry as well mm -hmm. from, you know, TV shows and, you know, and I've had this for a, for a few years now, you know, since easy 2018, where I'd be having those young chefs, whether they're really young in age or they were whatever in their previous lives decided they wanted to become chefs and they would expect that A, it's all glamour and, and you know, being you know, tattooed and sexy on the line to, oh, overnight, we're going to become a celebrity chef and rock and roll and, you know, be on TV. Both of which could happen, but not necessarily at the same time or... Or don't come into a work experience experience with that expectation. I think that just sets you up for disappointment no matter what field you're in. Absolutely. But it's funny, earlier you mentioned, um, uh, you know, people at home during COVID who were thinking about maybe how to make a change. Yeah. Now, your change didn't come during COVID. It came long before that. But yeah. what were you doing before? Because you haven't been in, living in Paris necessarily this whole time you've been cooking. No. Uh, but you also didn't start out cooking. No. So I started my uh, professional life as a, as a nurse, as an ER nurse. So growing up, I was always super interested in everything that's science and biology. And this was in Beirut. This was in Beirut. And, and in French, they call it science de la vie, sciences mm. of life. And I really like this expression because it doesn't sort of limit it to chemistry and biology and, you know, those sort of sterile names. It, it, indicates the origins of of everything you know the sciences of life so i've always been interested in that i had amazing biology teachers and you know whether it was human biology or 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 you know botanicals or mm -hmm. anything that was super interesting to me and at the same time i've just always wanted to become a, a doctor uh, now that is a different story, but it being super expensive, my mm. parents couldn't afford to send me to medical school. The next best, best thing was nursing school, mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. is, you know, four years university degree in Lebanon, which I did. And I started working first as a, a pediatrician pediatrics nurse mm. and then moved on to something which is um, a speciality that only exists in the U.S., I believe, but also in some, you know, countries that adapt American systems in healthcare, which is inhalation therapy. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And that's so you specialize into anything that's got to do with the cardiopulmonary system, respiratory system. So that's whether you're... Um, rehabilitating patients after a long time, um, you know, being under uh, intubator in, in the ICU or like that goes from this range or, you know, post-operation rehab onto reanimation in cases of cardiac arrest, whether it's in-house in the hospital or out. So really a full range, very exciting, you know, very, uh, you know, 
really, really cool. And you're in a, as a nurse, I felt it made sense because I really wanted to be there to help people live and, you know, being in a life or death situation. That's right. like, that's the limit of it, really. And it was very exciting. But then I didn't want to stay in Lebanon. So I got a job as an ER nurse in Brussels. Right. And that's where I moved, lived there. And then from there, I remember very specifically, I used to do a lot of night shifts. And one of the night shift uh, nurses, she was on a permanent night shift. Can you imagine? Oh, perm- I love night shifts. Oh, yeah? Oh, gosh, yeah. I'm a night owl. Okay. I, I, I feel I'm a lot more productive at night. So fascinating. It's just... I'm the opposite. But I, I'm so fascinated by this. So please continue because it's going to be illuminating. <laughs> So I had one of my night shift nurses who decided one day to sign up in a culinary school in the daytime. Ah. And it wasn't before that that it's like the, my very first reaction was complete and utter jealousy. <laughs> and I didn't understand why. It's like, why? Why? Like, why is that your reaction? Yeah, I loved cooking. Mm-hmm. You know, this is what I did. I loved hosting, actually. I loved hosting. I loved cooking for my friends. I would do parties, invite them over. Or whenever um, I'm on a night shift that I know would be sort of easy. You know, ERs are sort of like restaurants, you know. <laughs> you know when the busy nights are and you know when a sort of a night-ish night is. Okay. Yeah, it's you're in a, you know, a certain neighborhood of a certain city, you know, when it's busy or, you know, when people go out and get hurt. (laughs) Exactly. So, um, so obviously you've got some exceptions, but usually you'd know. And whenever I would know that, oh, tonight's going to be sort of easy, I would cook something at home, bring it over, and then we'll all have dinner together at whatever, 3 a.m. I don't know if you want to call it dinner, but I've always loved sharing things food with people and and that that immediate re- reaction of complete jealousy really made me you know stop and sort of ask myself why and it stayed with me i couldn't because back in the day i was dating this french japanese guy who you know then had to move back to japan and we were together so i decided to follow him mm. to japan and there uh, i couldn't work as a nurse because you had to redo your whole sure studies it wasn't which is understandable it wasn't compatible it wasn't at all and uh since we were getting married i had to um you know get some documents from the embassy and the ambassador was like who's this lebanese woman coming in to marry a japanese guy i'd like to meet her we sat we had coffee at the end of that coffee date if you want to call it he offered me a job he said, oh, well, we want someone in the consular section and I need a consular officer. Would you take the job? And I said, yes. Because you wanted to make sure you were occupied also. Yes, while you I, were... I needed a job. Right. You know, Japan back then was a lot more expensive, you know, relatively to Europe now, because now the yen has dropped. So mm. it was an expensive country. I needed a job. I, I needed a job full point. I couldn't just be a housewife, you know, mm. that wasn't within my DNA, still isn't. Um, so I got that job. It was fun. It was a new experience. I love new experiences. You meet new people. It's a whole new world. Uh, it was a nine to five job. And a lot of the times were just, you know, I didn't have anything really to do. So I would find myself just scrolling online for, you know, um, I don't know whether it's recipes or or things to do in the food business. And even I looked into Cordon Bleu Japan, which at the time only did the classes in Japanese. Ooh. And my Japanese wasn't, you know, I was just starting to learn Japanese. I didn't know that they had the system of translators and so on. Ah, okay. I learned later on. But that, like, pang stayed from Brussels. Like, I wanted to go to a culinary school. And the more I looked to it, into it, the more it made sense. So I started a, a blog. The blog years. Oh, my God. Remember but that's those? so, yeah, but you know what? That's how a lot of people found their... Yeah. Path. I mean, in some ways, that's how I started because I had a blog too. I mean, you know, and some people still have, you know, they'd call it something else, but it's essentially the evolution of a blog. And it was, I mean, back then, Instagram wasn't what it is today. No. 
it was just taking pictures, putting fancy filters on them, and that's it. <laughs> you know, I'm there was talking... no community yet. No, no, it was 2010, 2011. Yeah. Very early days, yeah. and it wasn't a medium of uh, careers or successes for whether industries or people. Mm -hmm. it, Instagram wasn't a career back then. So there was the blogs, as you've said. And I remember like one of my favorite blogs to read was, was uh, Smitten Kitchen. Oh, I love still, still. She, I mean, she she just has con continued to be amazing. So I understand that big, yeah. big um, success story. Yeah. So in a, in a way that was, but it, that was pre her, um, you know, publishing any books, etc. But she was so very successful, mm -hmm. and and it was kind of the inspiration of what I wanted to do. I didn't want to just publish a recipe. I wanted to tell a story as well sure. behind it, and and all these. Um, recipes had stories and if it didn't I wouldn't post it and they were they were a mix of Lebanese or Japanese recipes like what what were you at that time it was really what I would cook at home uh, mostly Lebanese I didn't post about Japanese cuisine because I was learning how to cook Japanese back then and the idea wasn't to hey let's learn things together which is super cool as well but really didn't ex exist right. back in the day it was more of a of a teaching standpoint right this really is what you know and yeah, this is what this I is can what create I'm showing yeah. you so it was a lot of uh, Lebanese cuisine it was a lot of baking because I loved that and slowly it started building a community but also putting myself out there um, catering uh, a few events and uh, teaching uh, Lebanese cuisine because this is what was unknown there right People really didn't know much about Lebanon uh, as a country or as a cuisine, uh, but it appealed a lot to the Japanese because it's sort of speaking the same language of, you know, working with produce and vegetables and simple ancestral cuisine mm -hmm. that speaks a lot to people like the Japanese. So it had uh, an appeal. Uh, and I was, you know, requested to do some, you know, classes, teach individuals at their homes, but also in a small cooking school for um, amateurs, really. Right, Laura. right, right. And this is how the path was forged as a start. And um, later on, in end of 2014, when my ex-husband had to come to France for mm. work, I told him, listen, I, we knew it was a two-year mission. We knew we had to move here and then who knows where else. And I told him, I'm not going to go through this again, trying to find a job, whether a nurse or at the embassy or this and that. I love cooking. This is what I want to do. I want to go to the culinary school. Um, I want to go to Cordon Bleu. Because to me, that was, you know, the dream. That was, oh my gosh, getting there. And and this is how it started. I went to culinary school. I went to Cordon Bleu. In Paris. In Paris. I was living in the north of France. That's right. You were tra you were you were coming in by train every day. By TGV every single day. Jeez. I was in Arras, so which is like a few kilometers away from Lille. Oh my goodness. Um I would take the TGV. I would wake up at five AM. Oh. And I'm not a morning person. Oh yeah, it's not, yeah. <laughs> knowing that now, yeah. I hated that. I had to. And my son was very, very, very young. Um, I would wake up at five, take the train down to Paris, Gare du Nord. From Gare du Nord, take a metro down to the 15th, right, which it's is far. all the way across the city. Have my whole day, run to catch my train at 10 p.m. back <gasps> home. Because that was the last train out of Paris to go to um, to Arras. Sometimes I'd miss it, so I'd have to sleep over here at some, you know, friends' houses and stuff like that. So you really wanted this? I really wanted this. And I was, you know, there was a healthy mix of men, women. It wasn't a gender issue. It was more of an age thing. I was one of the eldest in my mm. group. Or for that year anyway, there were just a handful who were, you know, you would see either there was this really cute American couple. They were in their, uh, they were retired. They were in their 60s, at least, maybe 70s, if I'm not mistaken. They would come in apparently every year or so to do one level 
and every level in Colombo is like three months. Mm. So they would come in, just do one level of pastry, come in, you know, the next year or two. They do it together. That's so cute. But really, I was one of the sort of eldest. I was one of the very few. There was probably in my year, not probably, there were only two moms there. Ah, uh, yeah. That's, I mean, that's a really tough uh, routine to try to manage, even if you were not a parent. Yeah. I mean, that's grueling. It is. It's a, it's a lot of work. It's very intense because it's a short uh, It was how period. long? It's, it's nine months and then you have to do, you don't have to do your stage, but it's very recommended that of you course. do. Um, a lot of them uh, went in as students, but those two moms, I know one of them went in because she really liked cooking and she wanted to do some business out of it. And the second one, it was just because her husband was placed here for work and she was living two streets down from Cordon Bleu and, and wanted to why do not? this while the kids right. were in school, which is, and she was amazing. She hmm. was really good, but she did not want this as a as a career path. Um, for me, I did. I wanted that, and I knew that it was sort of my only lifeline to get to getting into the industry at that age. Sure, I was. I was a lot older than anyone else. It's not your classic story of oh, sixteen year old in the kitchens, you know, earning your marks and and just getting there. I knew I was late in the game, mm. and that that was strike one against me. I'm a mom. That's strike two, or a parent, you know, who's had young children relying on them, and being a woman, you know. So these three points massively, massively holding you back in this industry, and I knew that that would be a problem. So for me, it was working twice as hard as anyone else and showing them your worth. Um, and that was sort of how I got into it. So before, if we were to jump ahead to you entering the industry, um, you didn't do that initially in Paris. No. Or, right. And you were you were cooking in Beirut, right? You yeah, went back so to Beirut. What I, I, in Paris, after I finished culinary school, I went. I, I interned in Taiwan. Ah, that's right, Taiwan. That was that was something. Uh, that was really fun. It was, um, you know, it's the Michelin world. It's only men. There were fifteen. I was the only woman. That's. Uh, um, I didn't do much work uh, there because, because they didn't give it to you. I wouldn't think so. No. <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a certain way of saying it, yeah. I don't know. I don't know why, but I do believe it was due to the fact that you know I'm a woman. I'm older. Like, ah, what is she going to do in her life? You know. So they didn't even believe you were going to actually make this a career. I don't think so. Or maybe it would be a career coming from money and privilege right. and you know things like that but oh how they underestimated you i think so i think so and and they were super nice to me well, you but... know but as a stagiaire going in having coffee with the chef in the morning while everybody did the cleaning you know that's not how stages work no, you know no um but really they were super super kind to me it's just the 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 way i entered it was you know, not 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 the way I'd imagine it to be. Mm. Fast forward when I moved back to Japan, this is when you know I had to look for a job, and it was in a real job in a real kitchen. Um, there were some women there. I wasn't the only one. You know, it was hard work. Um, I, it was you know I would be there at eight thirty a.m. We'd finish service at ten thirty p.m. Um, you know, having to run back home to a young child. Uh, so that was really, you know, my baptême de feu. Right. Baptism of fire yes, into the yes, kitchen. Yes. This is where it was. And then from there, I went to Beirut and things sort of, you know, cranked up a notch where now I'm a single mom. Mm. And when back in Japan, I was working these hard hours, but also, you know, I knew that my family did not rely on this income to survive. And I was still doing it for myself. Right. Uh, but then in Beirut, I was a single mom, had a child, I had no support. And back to square one, this child relies completely on me. Um, 
So I had to work hard. I had to be on the top of that pyramid because if you're not, you're not earning a living wage. You're not earning a living wage anyway, but you're getting paid better than other positions. Mm. And also you sort of have maneuver with your um, time uh, schedule, Mm -hmm. really. Uh, So I was a sous chef there in a restaurant for a few months and then ended up being a head chef in a in a restaurant called Baron. And for me, that was the pivotal sort of role and turn and restaurant and mentor and everything. This was, you know, the big 180 in Mm. my career in Baron. As a head chef, I was in the right time, in the right place with the right people. And it just launched my career there. So I know you, you know, you had another circuitous route back to to Paris, but if we jump ahead to, you know, because we go from the cooking you were doing, you know, in in Beirut, and then you were in Chantilly for a time cooking, but then Kubri, and what you're doing here, and maybe you'll tell me this is, you know, something like what you were doing in Beirut, maybe I'm you know, you no, tell me, it's, no, it's not similar. It's, no, it's, I mean, the restaurant in Beirut was uh, pan Mediterranean. If you okay, so di- very it. different. So okay. Different. So, what you're doing here, and, and I, I want to try to put words to or have you describe a little bit what it means. People have said it's contemporary Lebanese, it's creative. Yes, of course. But what to you is it that you're doing that takes it, to, you know, takes sort of the vernacular of, of, of Lebanese cooking and flips it a bit because it is different there's a there's yeah. a, a freshness a an in, inventiveness that you know i don't know if it's just in the it's not just the presentation it's also incorporating ingredients there yeah. seems to be you know uh, a, an element of your time in japan that comes through so what is it that, how do you see it um well first of all uh, maybe the thing that strikes people the most when they see this is the visuals visually speaking it's completely different than what a you know classic lebanese restaurant would serve it's not your traditional medzes uh served in the traditional way because lebanese cuisine is an ancestral cu- ancestral cuisine but um what there is there as well is that the representation of lebanese cuisine whether it's both in lebanon and abroad, uh, in the restaurant business anyway, has been always one-sided in a way where what you'd find in Lebanese restaurants would be that classic meze, uh, this whole list of whatever, 20, 30, however long you want to make it. You have that. It's it's really always the same thing. You've got those mezes, you've got those, you know, the hot ones and the cold ones, and then you've got your main dish, which is the... Um, you know, usually anything that's skewers, grilled, whatever. And that's pretty much it. That's that's Lebanese dining outside in a restaurant. Mm. And and you've got that whole other side of, of Lebanese home cooking that's just never had its voice in the table uh, or, or place on the table, both figuratively and literally right. speaking, really. Um, so I wanted to take that element and sort of give it a space pot or or a place under the spotlight and and in order to do so the the actual um those dishes by themselves aren't really sexy to look at it's just traditional home food and the challenge was how to make it appealing uh, to people uh people who are both lebanese and non-lebanese mm-hmm. It was a matter of appeal, really, to start with, wanting to take this traditional Lebanese uh, cuisine, home food, the ones that my mother made and my grandmother made and my neighbors made and my aunts made, like the ones people you live with cook and live off every single day. I wanted to put that on a menu, but I wanted to to be appealing. And what might a, a home dish be? A home dish would be stuffed uh, courgette. A ah. home dish would be uh, braised beef in a yogurt sauce and caramelized onions. Um, that would be, um, I don't know, braised greens mm. and lemon juice and fried shallots. It could be lentils and rice. It could be those really homey, grainy, stick to your ribs. <laughs> sort of food because Lebanon really if you look at it geographically it's it's a small stretch of of coast yeah 
and then just mountains. Yeah. And, and and really, essentially, you're either eating coastal food, which is fish. Yeah. It's it's citrus. It's seafood, but it's very seasonal. But mainly, mainly, you're eating mountain foods, and that's you know pulses and it's grains. It's everything that survives in, in those you know difficult to grow areas with rocks and you know it's not fertile lands of soil. And we do have this. It's a small country, though. I know. I basically traversed the whole country in 10 days. So the the whole repertoire of that cuisine is a lot of grains. It's a lot yeah. of pasta. It's a lot of dairy. It's a lot of, you know, um, stews. It's a lot of things like that. So how do you present this? How do you present uh, 60% stews and pulses and grains and lamb to people and, and have them want to come in and eat that? It's true that aesthetically, it it stands out immediately. Yeah. When the first dish is placed in front of you, you're like, okay, this is un autre niveau. It's yeah. it's a different register. Yeah. And you take this because if you pay attention to the menu, none of the dishes are um, a combination of many things together in terms of categories of food. When I'm plating or when I'm cooking, uh, I don't know, when I put... Um, let's say, uh, a lamb chop on the menu. It's not going to be a lamb chop and potatoes and, and, and Brussels sprouts and a salad. And it's just the lamb chop. When you're ordering the cabbage, it's just the cabbage with some sidekicks, mm -hmm. you know, to side make kicks. it shine. Sidekicks, I love that. But that's, that's how it is. This is how I see menus. And that's probably um, having lived in those countries mm -hmm. where, especially in Japan, where, you know, uh, this this whole idea of approaching food, whether it's food in itself or dining with, with a single subject, singular subject, uh, being the center of attention on a plate or in a restaurant that's very much Japanese, you know, whether you're eating sushi or you're eating ramen. So you go to a restaurant that only serves ramen and that's absolutely normal. Right. Or, you know, when you're having, I don't know, the vegetables, is everything is prepared simply and that whole core is always the shining star. And you always have some supporting actors there to just help it pop. But it's not all the sides on a plate like it's a Thanksgiving dinner. No, know? <laughs> it's it's not. And this is where, you know, there is this cross in those two cultures. Where in Lebanon as well, it's this thing where you, when you're having, you know, dishes don't have... Uh, the names of dishes in Lebanon, they don't have names other than what it is. You know? Fascinating. Yeah. Hummus is chickpeas. Right. So what are you eating? What are we making today? It's hummus. So it's both the word for the actual pulse or grain and the dish. Mm. Uh, and it goes on for so many other dishes. So that's an indicator to the simplicity of what goes onto the plate. And and giving it those supportive actors, supporting actors or those sidekicks onto the plate to make it shine, to give it what it deserves in terms of attention from the client and appeal because I know it tastes good whether I plate it in a traditional way or in a modern way it tastes good but you're also incorporating more uh, other uh, flavors other inflections I mean it's not just a modern um, presentation yes of a classic home dish absolutely it's, you're, you're also playing with it more in terms of composition. Yes, it's all the dishes really are. Uh, so I take this premise of, of whatever the traditional dish is. I'm expanding it a little bit to let through those, um, really my essence, uh, because, because uh, cooking and cuisine is a very personal uh, thing. It's very personal uh, offering to, to your client. It's very much like an artist when they're drawing. It's, it's when you're creating something, you're you're um, materializing something that before it hitting the plate, it only existed in your heart and mind. Mm -hmm. It really has to reflect you, in order not to resonate fake with your client. So every dish that comes out um, needs to somehow 
for the sake of sounding cliche, tell a story, sure. really. Mm. Um, whether it's uh, it's my own interpretation of this food at the end of the day, you know, I'm not there to, uh, I mean, let's face it, uh, Kubri is not a restaurant where, you know, it's another interpretation or another uh, iteration of Lebanese cuisine where you'd find it um, in other restaurants in the city, whether they're good and ba- or bad, that's not the discussion we're having. Um, it has a story to tell. It's a personalized uh, Lebanese cuisine. And and for it to be so, it's just coming from a, a time and place in my life. And this is how it ended up on a, on a plate. You know, I always joke that I've never called my mother this much. <laughs> in my life as I'm doing now especially in the beginning where I had to dig deep into you know as I've said I went to culinary school here I learned classic French cuisine I, I worked here in Lebanon and Japan but I never cooked Lebanese food professionally right before now so so the only points of reference that I have to this cuisine is whatever I ate growing up or or whatever you know my family did and this is when you start discovering that, oh, well, this is how I make this lemon cake or almond cake because my mother did this. And you discover that other people, actually, their moms did it differently. Mm. And, you know, there's a whole discussion that just opens there. And and that's what keeps it interesting, too. If everything were the same, I mean, yeah. I mean not to use uh, American food as a as a benchmark in any way, because it isn't. Uh, I mean, for me, it isn't. But, you know, even in a home kitchen, you make cornbread in f- f- five, ten different ways, you know. Yeah. And, and I only see that at Thanksgiving time when that when that comes up as a topic. But you start to see the varieties in, in these little dishes. And I think that's, it's exactly what you're describing, that it's personal. Yes, it's it's entirely personal uh, to to each family, but to each person as well. And if I think that, oh my gosh, you know what, hummus goes really well with this Japanese mushroom, because that dish, by the way, because <laughs> I know which one you're talking about, yeah. was a revelation, <laughs> and it worked beautifully. Yeah. Just like the broccolini with uh, labne and yeah. feta, which I know you've taken off the menu yeah. for now, right? I for mean, now. For now, I mean... God, it, and it, and I think I had that. Um, the French would say uh, "une claque," you know, like it was just such a breath of fresh air. I think, and we're in a time in Paris where there's a lot of Levantine food, and uh, you know, a little bit more experimentation when it yeah. comes to foods from elsewhere, which I think is is good, and it's not the first time. But I think there's a little bit more openness now than there was even five years, you know eight years ago. Um, What are some of the dishes that people have raved to you about the most in the, in the, in these nine months, you know, the thing, the dishes that have come back constantly like, wow, what was that? Um, I, if I had to choose one, I think it'll be the cabbage dish. Mm. Uh, It being again, a wedge of cabbage on a plate, no bells and whistles, apparently like, just as a as a first look, it seems like it no bells seems and whistles. It's like it's no bells and whistles. It's just a wedge of cabbage. It's such an understated vegetable anyway. And people are just blown away by how tasty it is. And I think that's um, a statement to 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 the cuisine itself because in itself that dish is not really Lebanese it's taking elements of the Lebanese uh, repertoire and ingredients etc putting them together in a way that makes it a dish but um, this speaks loads of um, the way I see food where every single ingredient should shine Mm -hmm. and also presenting it simple does not mean it's not complex. You know, simplicity and complexity, for me, work together. They're not opposite to each other. Oh, does that bear repeating? No, because <laughs> I think people do, you know, especially when they come to a city like Paris. You know, it's either ultra simple and the stews and the the classic French fare, or it's the very visually and uh, f- 
what do we call this flavor flavor uh what what am i saying here uh, visually versus flavorful <laughs> versus that's not, uh, not a real word <laughs> gustatorally <laughs> uh, flavorly let's invent a new word <laughs> i mean that's just embarrassing um <laughs> Or they're looking to fine dining, which is, you know, just as complex uh, in design as it is in flavor. Yes. Um, but, but you know, I think, yeah, some people have this gut reaction when they see something simple on the plate that they're not getting their money's worth. Yeah. But actually, that isn't the case with, with, with your cooking at Kubri. I mean, you both see that it's, and I wouldn't even say it's very simple. I mean, it's, it's not uh, overwrought. Yeah. But... It's beautiful. So I think there's like a, um, I don't know, it's not, uh, I don't know, I don't know. It's, it's, it's like organic not, beauty. On yeah, plate. Okay, I don't want to make that. squares and rectangles <laughs> and hoops and bells and like, I don't do this. It's just, it's, it just feels wrong. It feels like. It's not tweezer food. It's not tweezer food. And again, I'm not shaming anyone or any category of food. It's just not me. Mm. You know, I don't go out in stilettos in the streets. <laughs> I don't use this on my feet. Why would I use it on my plate? It's not me. It's just, again, a representation and a, and a, it's me on a plate for, for as much as a cliche statement as this might sound, but it's me on a plate. Otherwise, what's the point? What's the point of me doing what I'm doing? If it's not representing my mind and my heart and my soul and my history, you know, what's the point? It's just like an artist whose life's work is copying Picasso. Right. Like, where's the originality? In right, right. So that's my print. That's my stamp. It's, it's you know, things that fall organically on the plate, things that play well together. Uh, visually it has to be appealing mm -hmm. you know otherwise again like we're in it's always been anyway in the food industry it's always been uh, the aesthetic that mattered as much as the taste sometimes in some eras actually it's been still the same sometimes the aesthetics to some people are more important than taste um, but then it's all depending on the client and what they're looking for well, there's also a certain trend, and maybe people do find this aesthetically appealing, but the sort of blob uh, presentation, which where every dish looks like a blob. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it may be the most flavorful and extraordinary, you know, taste bomb in your mouth, but visually it looks, you know, like a child put their hand in paint, you know? And yeah. But, but you know, there are these movements, there are the moments when, you know, people want that because it's what is seems to be valued more but i think at the end of the day the standard is for something that does have a balance of of beauty and or or beauty in its comfort value or its comfort quotient and then the flavor but what you're doing is just so um heartwarming also and especially and maybe i'm biased because i've been to lebanon and so i had you know i kind of fell in love with the cooking um in, in the span of 10 days in a way that I hadn't he, only, you know, based on my experiences in with Lebanese food in Paris. Um, and this just sort of unlocked. It's like I unlocked another level in a video game, you know, it just <laughs> yeah. leveled up. Um, what to you now that, it, you know, you've been here a number of years and you're I'm I'm under no impression that you have plenty of time to go dining at uh, around the city. But broadly, what do you observe about where Paris is? with its food and dining scene today? Well, right now, it's it's sort of encouraging to see because it's always been a frustration of mine, at least for Paris, where um, ethnic food wasn't really represented. And that's also, you know, part of the uh, line of thought behind Kubri. Like, uh, there's, there's no ethnic food that's represented for its own value with, you know, no excuses. Uh, it's just what it is on a plate. I, you don't want it to be whitewashed. You don't want it to be dumbed down. You don't want mm. it to be changed to please the masses here. And uh, maybe it's generational. Maybe now it's due to the fact that young French people are more willing and open to, uh, 
try new things. Maybe it's due to the fact that I don't know where it's coming from. Uh, maybe it's a global trend that it's finally catching up mm. here. I do think it's a little bit of everything mm. uh, that now uh, a lot of, you know, hard, like the trailblazers in putting ethnic food on the international scene have done a hard work in doing so elsewhere but they've got such a great job where echoes of of what could be done in so and so cuisine now has just rippled all through the world and sure and catches on as a trend but trends aren't always necessarily a bad thing no. you know so now when it's really trendy to you know and people are cur curious about regional mexican cuisine you know now we're not just talking about mexican cuisine or tex-mex god that's even worse that's terrible yeah. now we're talking <laughs> about i don't know yeah what is regional cuisine. yeah and people and are looking for that And it's there. It's there in the media. It's there uh, in the restaurant. And Paris is finally catching up with this. Again, I don't think it deserves to be called a trend for its negative connotations. It's no, it's more it, it arrives and then it has staying power now. Yeah. Yeah. And and it being it's the, this this whole scenery, the culinary scene changing, like blooming for me, it's blooming. It's not blooming. even changing in Paris where you see people and I've been lucky enough to meet some of those chefs and maybe have, you know, like um, Erica from we met in Cordon Bleu and oh, yeah, from Morena. Yeah. You know, Filipino cuisine just there on a, on apologetic. She put a half a head of big on a plate right. you know how straightforward like this is this is so refreshing to me where people are representing themselves their cultures no hiding no changing no makeup on come as you are this is how it's slowly changing and it's so refreshing to see this it really is not to you know the, the french cuisine has its uh, place on the table and this is why for me i enjoy a lot more going to a, a bouillon yeah uh, or, uh, or you know those kind of uh, very casual very casual french uh, restaurant because Again, it goes back to the same thing. It's cooking the people's food. Yeah. The people's food. This is what I want to eat, whether it's mine or other people's foods. This is this is the 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 red line that red thread that connects, you know, straight through from one heart to another to another to another. And through that, you sort of understand people's cultures more. Mm. Because if you're willing to sit in front of a plate and ask yourself questions, sometimes you don't want to, and that's okay. That's sometimes very you just true. want to enjoy the food, and and that's it. But if you really, really want to, there's a story to be learned there. There's a history to be learned there. Why is it that in that country they eat this kind of food? Why is it that this chef is cooking it in this way and not another way? Mm. There are stories to be told, and they're all there. It's they're there. In front of us, it's up to us to pick up that book and read it, you know. And this is what's refreshing. Whether I get to go eat that food or not, whether I enjoy it or not, because food is a matter of personal taste as well. Absolutely. I might not like a food from a certain region, but that does not mean that I'm super happy that it's there and it's represented in its own true self. You know, just in the same way where I'm not attracted to every single man that walks the street in front of me. <laughs> it's just the same thing, you know. It's um, it's there. And, and I'm really happy that it's finally catching on. I think you nailed it. I think that's exactly there's there's this sort of uh, gradual. It's a crescendo. And we're finally we're finally there. And now there's nothing but potential, yeah. really, to do to keep experimenting and to keep telling those stories and exploring them uh, if you're a diner. So you're about to go on summer break. Yes. Uh, Kubri has been a hardworking machine for the last <laughs> nine months, and oh, so yeah. have you, and you need a break. <laughs> so uh, give people just a teaser, maybe, or a, even a, a word or two of what's going to come when you're for, for la rentrée, for the reopening, if they're going to come in September and be here through the fall. What are you excited about on the menu? I'm really excited. So after we come back from holidays, obviously the uh, the, uh, the summer menu is still on uh, for a for, few weeks mm -hmm. after that because it's still going to be summertime. But the newest, newest thing that we're thinking about is probably introducing a Sunday brunch. Ooh. Yeah. 
Because there is also this whole side of, and you've been to Lebanon and you know that the, the brunch, not as in a, you know, Western experience kind of a way, but brunch and morning foods. Morning foods, yes. It, that you can eat whole, even at two in the afternoon. Yeah, exactly. It's a whole category in itself. And uh, this is the only thing that I still didn't have the chance to put on the menu just because you're not going to be able to put it on a dinner menu. No. And and now considering the idea of, well, you know what, well, we're, we're slowly but very shortly, very seriously looking into this for maybe fall. Okay. Uh, to start a Sunday brunch. So that's what I'm kind of most excited about right now. Well, now I am too. So <laughs> you've given me something to think about for our, our little summer slowdown. And I can't wait to see what you do. And Rita, you're, you're doing something so important in the food scene here. And it's, and it's exciting that it's happening, of course, not far from where I live, yeah. which is just, <laughs> again, is. I'm very spoiled. <laughs> um, but this has been enlightening and you are Absolutely delightful. And I hope everyone listening, when they come to town or if they already live here, which is very possible as well, they book in for lunch or dinner or maybe brunch to come. And please come say hi. I love when people come talk. Yes, go talk to Rita because that's how ultimately we hit it off. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Un grand merci. merci and <laughs> have a great vacation. Thank you. You too. That's the show for today. Thanks, as always, for listening. I'm hugely grateful for all of your support over the years. I'm about to take a little summer pause to work on some other projects, in addition to some special episodes coming to this show for September, so stay tuned. In the meantime, you have lots of episodes you can catch up on if you've missed any, and I'd be very grateful if you would take the time to subscribe and rate and comment on the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you stream your shows. Until next time, a bientôt.